All right, good morning. My name is Mary Jane Puffer and I am the Vice President of the California School-Based Health Alliance Board. And I'm so excited to welcome you to the second day of this virtual conference. And also again, asking you for grace, if there's glitches like please with grace. But it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the California State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurmond. He's gonna welcome you today Tony Thurman is a friend and a champion of student health and wellness. He's an educator, a social worker, and a public school parent. He's worked in schools providing mental health services to students and has promoted school-based health centers, the community schools model, and student wellness throughout his career. We are grateful for Superintendent Thurman's leadership in California and nationally. Two weeks ago, in the face of the threat of cuts to federal education funding, Superintendent Thurman announced an education to end hate initiative that will include training for teachers to teach tolerance for differences in race and religion, virtual classroom sessions on how to end discrimination, and a summit with political and social justice leaders on how to create safe learning environments. This is just one example of how we know we have an ally and a powerful leader in Sacramento at a time we need it most. We are grateful for his leadership and pushing for a school experience that includes all Californians. Thank you, Superintendent Thurman, for joining us today. Thank you, MJ, um, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you to everyone uh, who was part of today's School-Based Health Alliance. Um, and thank you for the title. I can't imagine what, you know, school-based health seemed to me to be challenging enough to provide under typical circumstances, doing so on the front lines in the pandemic just seems to have taken things up to uh, increase the intensity. Um, but certainly we know that the need is there. I'm grateful uh, for all of you. I'm grateful for an opportunity to introduce a great colleague and friend who is uh, an equity champion and uh, probably needs no introduction. And Dr. Smith Arriaga, I'm so grateful uh, for you and your work. And for all of you, wherever you are, I hope that you're continuing to be safe and well. I wanna start with just a word of thanks to anyone who's working in a school-based health center, or who's a partner to a school-based health center, who makes referrals to school-based health centers, if you're an educator who makes your, sure your students are connected to health resources, thank you. These are, uh, it's a, it, an understatement to say that these are um, unusual, daunting, and challenging times. And I believe probably um, one of the toughest challenges and experiences that we, most of us will see in our lifetime. Uh, but having said that, our students deserve the right to an education, and health is an equity issue. Um, this is something that we have known um, long before the pandemic, that many times uh, a student's education might be impacted uh, by health issues and about uh, by their ability to access health care. School-based health um, clinics have been uh, an important model for us to deliver health for students, and in some cases, their families, and we are grateful for the incredible resources that our school-based health center communities uh, provide. So I'm thankful to all of our school-based health professionals, to our educators, uh, to our students. I, I am grateful to our students for their resilience. Uh, this, is, this is an incredible time. And I see our students leaning in. I see our educators leaning in. I see our parents leaning in. I have to shout out our families, uh, holding it down, trying to manage a day job, trying to manage, you know, uh, supporting and guiding our students during school. Um, I have to acknowledge that we have literally hundreds of thousands of students who do not have a computer at home, who do not have access to the internet. Many of you know that in March, I, I named a task force on closing the digital divide. We've literally been able to move hundreds of thousands of computing devices and hotspots uh, for students, but it's not enough. I bring this up because many of you know that right now, health in many ways can only be provided through telehealth. And if you don't have access to the right tools, how do we get access to that? So our struggle is connected. When we talk about the digital divide, we are talking about health and we're certainly talking about equity. We've got a lot of work to do, um, but we won't stop. And I am grateful to all of you <clears throat> who are on the front lines and who are serving our young people and our families <clears throat> in spite of the conditions that we currently face. Uh, you know, I wanna shout out, uh, you know, a number of people, you know, years ago, Maybe a hundred years ago, I was a school board member in West Contra Costa and um, all of our six comprehensive high schools, all of them had um, a health center. I'm grateful to uh, the folks there who worked with us to make that happen. 
We became a full service community schools district and that also expanded our health and our mental health offerings at the district. You know, many of you know, I worked in social work. I still think of myself as a social worker, just my practice area is politics and bringing change. You know, we we worked with in Oakland in, in particular is where I spent most of my time working for school based mental health organizations. We really partnered with uh, our, our uh, school clinics in ways that are just so important. And I'm grateful um, to partners like uh, Alex Briscoe, who might be participating today, um, you know, who at the time when he was the county health director uh, or the behavioral health uh, agency director, open more school-based health clinics, a, a, a historic number. Um, I think that's a model that should be replicated in other parts of the state. Uh, I'm thankful to the School-Based Health Alliance for really working on um, legislation to allow for the expansion of more school-based clinics that we needed. I wanna thank everyone out there who's a school-based nurse, who's been holding it down um, even before the pandemic and now during the pandemic. Uh, I wanna thank the California School Nurses uh, Association who really been out there talking about how we need to expand resources like Medi-Cal and Medi-Cal billing option to get more counselors and more support. Uh, a number of you know, uh, many of you know that we've announced an effort to help school districts leverage more Medi-Cal dollars um, so that they can bring in more counselors, but it's, it, it's, but it's rife with barriers. It's not, you know, California leaves more money on the table in terms of federal dollars that are available, but it's because there are so many barriers to getting to those Medi-Cal dollars. And so maybe we'll work on some legislation together that allows districts to get some of the, the, the startup money that they need to actually access those Medi-Cal dollars. Because I know if we start addressing those things like chronic absenteeism, there's often a health nexus to why kids didn't come to school even before the pandemic. Um, what we found is that students might have asthma, there might be more serious or chronic health conditions that often impacted our students' ability to, to get access to a quality education. So we've got a lot of work to do. I'm thankful to our, our all of our county health officers who we've worked closely with. We pulled them together with all of the county superintendents and school district superintendents to talk about how do we even open school and how can we be safe? I'm grateful to folks at the California Department of Public Health who've created a, a kind of metrics for when schools can safely open and when it's really just not safe uh, for them to be open. And we've got to follow those guidelines. We've got to follow those metrics. I'm hoping that many of you will join us in a new endeavor that we are continuing to promote. I call it the Counseling Coalition. It's really just a way of pulling together various practicing groups to address students who are impacted by the pandemic, many of whom didn't check into school during distance learning because they might have been with their families scrambling to find you know, basic aid or basic needs or meals or whatever the issue was, or maybe they experienced homelessness, maybe someone lost a job. We have this counseling coalition that really is intended to provide triage, to really provide short-term support for anyone who's looking for counseling during the pandemic. We know that there's a higher rate of depression and other mental health challenges for our students and for our families. And so we hope that many of you will join us in our efforts um, to build this counseling coalition. Dr. Daniel Lee, who's on our staff, he's our deputy superintendent uh, for equity. He's on today's uh, Zoom program. He is uh, uh, available if you wanna work with our counseling coalition. And I wanna thank a lot of groups like our state social workers, our, our school counselors, our school psychologists, uh, MFTs and others who are who are working on the issues of mental health, but we would welcome um, health groups and health centers to work with us. Make sure we know where students are and we find whatever support they need and we find ways to provide it. Uh, health is an equity issue and we must continue to persevere even in the face of the pandemic, even in the face of fires that literally have burned homes, have taken lives, have destroyed schools and we have worked with our families. We know that right now air quality is a serious issue in many of our communities. We've been sending N95 masks to many communities across the state. There's so many challenges, but there are many, many opportunities and we must continue to persevere through these difficult times to make sure that we continue to provide health as an equity uh, opportunity. Thank you for framing today's conversation through the lens of equity because it is the ultimate equity issue. Uh, for our well-being and, and if it becomes a barrier to student success and to closing our opportunity gaps, we must pursue our new resources through the lens of health. So I'm grateful for all of you. I'm looking forward to the lessons that we can learn. Um, I wanna encourage everyone to continue to remind everyone that we cannot control the pandemic, but we can control how we respond to it by wearing a face mask 
and maintaining six feet of distance at all times and always washing our hands. We can counter the man-made pandemic of racism and we must do more to have courageous conversations about race and about prejudice and about bias of all kinds. And we invite you all to join our conversation about how we use education to counter racism and bias. And to all of you who've applied for mini grants, um, we put out $200,000 in mini grants, have made them available in the last two weeks. We'll be making some announcements about that. Uh, there's a place for us all in using health. Thank you for being on the front lines. I ask now that you uh, provide your undivided attention to someone who needs no introduction, who's an incredible partner and champion in the world of equity um, and data um, and justice, none other than Dr. Smith, uh, Alicia Smith Adiaga. Uh, thank you and look forward to your remarks. Okay, thank you so much, Superintendent Thurman. That was amazing and perseverance is key. So thank you for mentioning that as well. But we are all in this together. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, Dr. Alicia Smith Ariaga, who serves as the Executive Director of the Education Trust West. The Education Trust West is a California-based organization that supports educational justice. And as Executive Director, Dr. Smith Ariaga focused on four areas in our state, diverse and effective educators and leaders, adequate and equitable funding, equitable access and success, and accountability, transparency, and engagement. As part of this work, Dr. Smith Ariaga and her team have created a guide for schools to shift the focus away from fixing kids towards addressing adult beliefs and mindsets, as well as school and district policies to create an equitable learning environment. Many students of color and students from low income backgrounds are often seen by schools as broken or needing to be fixed, which undermines their excellence and results in real and harmful consequences when in fact the context in which students learn is exactly what should be addressed. Dr. Smith Ariaga doesn't just come to this work from a policy perspective, it's personal for her. She watched her parents fight for civil rights while she was growing up. Her father was one was in one of the first classes to integrate the University of Mississippi Law School, and her mother helped establish anti-discrimination laws in her hometown after filing a lawsuit over employment discrimination. Dr. Smith Arriaga earned her PhD from Princeton, and she says she's a researcher by training, but an advocate by blood. Please welcome me and please join me in welcoming Dr. Smith Arriaga. Thank you. Well, thank you so much uh, for just such a lovely introduction. And um, I'm just so honored to be able to join all of you today uh, for what I re really hope will be a conversation about um, the state of school health. And we're really also trying to want to create some space to hear from you about what your ideas are, what legislation you'd like to see on the table, what changes you would like to see to really center equity um, at this critical moment in our history. So uh, before I get started, I should also say that, you know, in, a, in addition to some of the things that were outlined in the introduction, um, I'm a, a school health advocate at the heart. Um, before this role, I actually did a lot of work um, in Oakland with folks uh, such as Ignacio Ferry and many others who I think are on this call from the Alameda County uh, Department of Health, where we were working with the Youth, health, youth Heart Health Center uh, at Dewey Academy and, you know, just really saw the power and the importance of school health and academics and really being able to um, make sure the students were able to access opportunities um, and at the same time access high quality health care. So just want to say thank you again for all that each of you do every day, especially in these trying times. So um, I'll start by telling you a little bit more about the Education Trust West. Um, our mission, and we can go to the next slide, is really focused squarely on educational justice for California students of color and low-income students. And each of you today and every day are really a critical part of that mission. Now, my husband is a child psychologist, so I see firsthand how important and how hard the work of caring for students' physical and mental health is. And I don't have to tell you that the work that you do is even more crucial in this, let's call it very unique moment in our history. 
Now, I want to talk a little bit about that moment that we're in right now. So as you heard in the introduction, um, I was, I'm, I'm from Mississippi. I was born in Tupelo, Mississippi. Um, and you heard the stories of gr growing up uh, in Mississippi where my parents were really a big part of the civil rights movement. Um, and one of the biggest days I remember in my childhood was walking into my living room and seeing Yolanda King there in our house, the daughter of Martin Luther King Jr. Now, Yolanda was a friend of my mother's, and for me, it was the closest thing to meeting a celebrity I had even I had ever encountered, and it still might be. And that moment, along with so many others, um, from as early as I can remember, my parents really instilled in me that the rights that we enjoyed were only recently won with the blood, sweat, tears, and the lives of many before me. And they also taught me that the struggle was far from over. So as you heard, my father was really one of the first classes to integrate University of Mississippi. Law school, my mom um, brought lawsuits against her hometown that changed anti-discrimination laws there for years to come. And so I've known from the time that I was a little girl that just like them, I have a responsibility to honor the sacrifices of my predecessors by continuing the march toward justice. And that's just what I've tried to do. But I've never been part of a moment like this one, like the one my parents were part of in the 60s and the 70s where we are standing so clearly at a fork in history's road. The way that I look back at my parents and what they struggled for, that's how I want my son and all our children to look back at us. I want them to be able to say that in the fight against racial injustice, in the midst of a global pandemic, that our parents, our teachers, the adults in our lives, put us first, that they prioritize our education and our wellness. That's what I hope that my son can say. Now, long before the pandemic came to our shores, California was battling an epidemic of educational inequality. So whether it's quality early education or access to the most experienced teachers, advanced coursework or college opportunity, we give the least access to the students who need it the most, to students of color and low-income students. And the results are predictable. The system is designed to produce unjust outcomes, and that's exactly what we've gotten in the past. Now, we've made a little progress in recent years, but the hard truth is that we need to do much better, much faster. Now, my son is six years old, and at the rate we're going, he'll be old enough to be a grandfather by the time we close the opportunity gap in math for Black and Latinx students in California. Earlier this year, we got the results of the first ever statewide science assessment, and we learned that less than one in five African-American, Latinx, and low-income students are meeting standards in science compared to 44% of white students. For English learners, it's just 3%. Think about that. We have the most Latinx students in the country, but we rank 38th in Latinx college degree attainment. 38th out of 50. Now, that was all before COVID, before school buildings were shuttered, before millions of jobs vanished, before families were scrambling to find computers and tablets and stable internet connections, before nearly 200,000 Americans, disproportionately Black and Latinx Americans, lost their lives. And it was before we were forced to watch the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, of Ahmaud Arbery and Jacob Blake in the hospital. 
Now, you all know better than anyone what kind of impact all of this can have on students, academically, socially, and emotionally. And you know how violence and trauma affects families and communities. And you know, like I do, that if we ju just keep doing what we've been doing, our equity crisis will only deepen. Now, equity, it's a word that's thrown around so casually in education discussions these days and with so many different definitions that we often lose sight of what it really means. Now, at its core, equity is about understanding each student's unique strengths and needs and getting them exactly what they need to thrive. And there's one aspect of equity that is too often left behind ensuring that we truly listen to and design solutions around the people closest to the problem. In our case, that means really hearing students and parents, what they're experiencing, what they need, how we can support them. And that's why when the pandemic first hit, my organization conducted a survey of more than a thousand parents across California. About half reported higher than usual stress levels for children. 80% told us their own stress was elevated. And we know that children feel that stress too. And this won't surprise you at all. 91% of parents said they would benefit from more contact with school counselors. Now, we also work closely with an organization called Youth Truth which specializes in gathering direct input from students about their experiences. Unsurprisingly, they found that students are feeling the emotional distress of being separated from their classmates. Just three in 10 say they really feel like part of their school's community and a similar percentage say they feel connected to their school. Now, those are some daunting statistics. But our kids are also resilient. With our love and support and creativity, California students and our whole state can emerge from this moment stronger than ever. I talked earlier about being at a fork in the road. And we know that down one of those paths, the path where we do more of the same and expect different results, is a moral and an economic catastrophe. But the thing about forks in the road is that there's always a second path. My boss and friend, former education secretary, John King says, crises don't have silver linings, but they can be inflection points. So if we want California to be the kind of state where every child truly has an equal opportunity to live out their dreams, we must make this moment an inflection point. Now, earlier I mentioned my son, Elliot. Elliot just started first grade. And there are pieces of what I'm seeing from his teachers and his school that give me tremendous hope for the future. So one of the first things that Elliot's school did this year was to assess him and all of his classmates one-on-one, -on -one, not to punish them or to track them, but to really understand where they are and what they need to thrive. Instead of one first grade teacher, students are having a chance to work with three. Each teacher is focused on giving individually tailored support in specific subjects like math and reading. A few weeks ago, they started math classes in groups of six so that they could get more individualized instruction. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying distance learning is the future or should be the new normal. There have been plenty of challenges and we know that too many students are not getting the live interactive instruction time that they need. But what I am saying is that this is a chance for us to wipe away our preconceived notions about how we do school and to recreate it with a vision centered around justice and equity. So here's what I'm asking you to do today. First, I'm asking you to be a co-conspirator for justice and for equity. 
an instigator for change at your schools and in your communities. As John Lewis said, if you see something that is not right, you have to do something. You are all in a unique position of being closer to the real lives of students and families than almost anyone. So be their advocates and their allies. When buildings reopen, there will be a tremendous pressure to revert back to the old normal. Don't let that happen. Challenge yourselves and your colleagues to think creatively about what school can be, not just what it has been. Ask them to infuse social emotional learning and anti-racism in everything they do. Not as a one-off or an add-on, but baked into the policies and the culture of all of our instruction. Now we know that students' social, emotional, and physical health is inextricably linked to their academic success. So it's hard to learn when you can't see the whiteboard or when you're thinking about where your next meal is going to come from or when all you can think about is how much your tooth aches. But it's more than that. We know that learning starts with meaningful relationships and a sense of belonging. So our team recently released a math equity toolkit that is an example of how we can incorporate anti-racism in daily instruction. Some of the recommendations in that toolkit, as you would expect, are about access to standards aligned curriculum and rigorous expectations. But one of those five strides, we, we ask educators, what we ask them to do is to, is to incorporate social, emotional, and academic development themes together. This really has four components, belonging, agency, identity, and discourse. These characteristics allow students to see their own cultural assets reflected in their schoolwork, to build relationships, to see themselves as leaders and thinkers, and to create a climate of mutual respect. And with school buildings closed for months on end, students are losing opportunities to develop these crucial senses of self. I would encourage you to take a look at the toolkit and to share it with your friends who are classroom teachers, school leaders, and administrators. Second, now more than ever, we need to exercise our civic duties. Vote, volunteer, donate if you can. Education equity is on the ballot in California this year. Prop 16 would end California's ban on affirmative action to begin leveling the playing field for women and people of color. It can be hard to know where to start tackling systemic racism and sexism, but Prop 16 is a concrete step we can take to do just that. Prop 16 can help diversify our school health centers, and it's one of the most important things we can do for educational justice in California. In states that allow affirmative action, women and people of color earn higher wages and they're able to compete on equal footing for state contracts. But right now, California is one of just nine states in the country to ban affirmative action. Prop 16 is our chance to change that. It would allow us to direct funding to support students of color, to recruit and retain a more diverse teaching core and to expand access to college opportunity. We also need to pass Prop 15, which would close corporate loopholes and invest $8 billion in public education. And since those loopholes were put in the system, California has gone from top 10 in public education funding to 38th. That level of disinvestment coincides with growing numbers of students of color in our schools. Coincides is the wrong word really, because it's hardly a coincidence. So make sure you vote, that you talk to your friends about these important measures and that you get involved however you can. And then finally, this is the hardest one, but it's very important. I wanna ask you today to examine bias in your own work. Now, 
that's always been a difficult conversation with ourselves. But every single one of us, myself included, has unconscious biases that we have absorbed from living in a country that centers whiteness. Now, this is especially important right now. I talked a bit about the toll COVID and systemic racism are taking on our students, especially Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Asian American students. And because of that toll, there will be an instinct, a well-intentioned instinct, to view our students as having been damaged by this experience. But as a field, we need to rid ourselves of the view of children as broken, as needing repair. What is broken and what needs fixing are the systems and structures within which our students learn. So instead of looking at what students don't have, look at what they do. Consider their unique strengths and their assets. Meet them where they are. Ask how you and your colleagues can change the context to support those assets. For example, consider whether your school's discipline system and dress code communicate to all students that they are equally welcome. Whether the coursework and the instruction communicates that all students' cultures and their languages and their backgrounds are equally valued. And whether the ways in which families and students and support networks are engaged, whether it shows them that every member of the school community is equally important. Now, our national office recently released a report examining social, emotional, and academic development through an equity lens. And the timing of that report could not be more apt. With everything students are experiencing right now, social emotional support is more important than ever. But one of the report's troubling findings is that the way we approach social emotional development in many places may actually do more harm than good. And that's especially true with approaches that either lack an explicit equity lens, maybe approaches that fail to acknowledge the role of students, ones that treat social emotional and academic learning as something separate, or fail to address the processes and structures in schools that systemically disadvantage students of color, low-income students, and immigrant youth. So changing our approach to actually support students starts by changing our own mindsets and beliefs from a deficit-based to a strengths-based approach, from a one-size-fits-all approach to accounting for students' unique cultural and contextual influences and from accepting bias to actively working to rooting it out. And we have to translate those beliefs into new systems and policies that do things like foster student belonging, challenge students to reach their potential, and provide academic and holistic supports. So I'll tell you one last story. And this one's only sort of a story about my son, but it does illustrate what it can look like to shift our own mindsets in a way that shifts policy and practice. So before COVID happened, um, I was touring Oakland Public Schools, like you do when you have a rising kindergartner. And you know, you see the buildings, you ask some questions, um, you try to decide how to rank your preferences. And I was at one of Oakland's few dual immersion, dual language immersion schools, which by the way, we definitely need more of those. And the principal of the school had been there a really long time. And parents were asking about how she handled conflicts that arose in the school. And so the principal then told the story of a young boy of color who was a second grader, who about halfway through the school year started acting out in class. Parent after parent started coming to the principal, complaining that the young boy was disrupting the classroom and it all came to a head one day after a large number of parents asked the principal, what was she going to do to solve the issues arising in the classroom with the young boy? And the principal turned to the parents and she said, no, what are you going to do? 
And at that moment, the parents started to change how they were working. They organized a carpool to help with pickups and drop-offs. They learned the student was unstably housed. And so they worked to organize more play dates and activities out school, outside of school with that student and with his parents. And over the course of that semester, that student's behavior changed and the complaints about the class disruption stopped. So what the principal did in that moment was really flip this dominant assumption about who is responsible for improving her school's community. She stepped into a room of angry parents and convinced them that it wasn't just up to the school or to the principal to help that child, but it's up to all of us. She saw that student not as a lost cause who is disrupting others, but as a unique individual with the strengths to succeed. And by seeing those strengths, she helped the other parents see those strengths as well. And to galvanize around those strengths and to reinforce them. Now that's justice and equity in action. And justice and equity in action is very much what this moment calls for. Like millions of Americans, I watched pieces of both the Democratic and the Republican National Conventions the other month. And there were plenty of memorable moments, both good and bad. But the comment that really stuck with me didn't come from a Democrat or a Republican. It didn't come from a politician at all. It came from George Floyd's family, speaking of their fallen brother and of so many other black men and women killed simply for being black in America. They said, it's up to us to carry on the fight for justice. Our actions will be their legacies. Our actions will be their legacies. And as we go back to school virtually, and then hopefully eventually in person, as we go to the polls in November, as we go about our lives, let's commit to letting our actions be a legacy that they can be proud of. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to your questions and your comments and ideas about how we can continue to work together to center equity for the future of California students. Thank you. Thank you so much, Superintendent Thurmond and also um, Dr. Smith Adiaga. Um, I wanna just encourage folks to submit any questions or comments they have for either of our speakers in the chat or Q&A box that you see. We're gonna take a few minutes to um, give an opportunity uh, for Dr. Smith Adiaga to answer questions. I don't know if Dr. Thurman, if Superintendent Thurman is available for questions. And it looks like he is, wonderful. We'll just give a few minutes for that. Um, I'll briefly introduce myself in the interim. So I'm picking up the MC role from Mary Jane. I'm Tracy Mendez. I'm the executive director at the California School-Based Health Alliance. I'm so happy to be here with you all today. I'm so grateful to be in the room with uh, what I consider two celebrities, um, Superintendent Thurmond and Dr. Smith Ariaga. I'm so grateful for you both um, speaking with us today and encouraging us to be co-conspirators for equity and justice. Um, I think we all want to pick up that, that mantle. Um, and we're seeing lots of appreciation in the comments so far for, for your words, both of you. Um, I think lots of amens and, um, and appreciations. Let's see if there's any questions coming through. Don't be shy folks, we have time for this and it's such a good opportunity. You'll be stuck listening to my questions. And actually I'll give a pause and see if uh, Superintendent Thurman wants to ask Dr. Uh, Smith-Ariaga or vice versa. 
imagine you could have a good dialogue. Uh, first of all, I just say it was an incredible uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Smith Ayaga. Thank you. I think it's. Uh, I think you. I, I appreciate that you thought about health and equity in the broadest terms, and that everything is related and connected. And I think you pointed out all the kind of challenges that we face, and that we have to do more. Um, whether it's uh, directly related to uh, learning gaps that have been um, accelerated because of the pandemic. Um, and whether or not it is um, uh, about how we help students uh, deal with the trauma that they see uh, from the killing of George Floyd and, uh, and just the way those feelings are exacerbated when, um, when there's a ruling that says no one is held responsible for the killing of Breonna Taylor. And so I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm grateful that you've been partnering with us and um, accepted our invitation to serve as one of the co-chairs of our work on closing the opportunity gap. Um, one of the things that your uh, survey prompted us to do is to try and build capacity around how uh, we help schools um, do a better job around family engagement. Um, what I learned from reading your survey is that so many families just felt that they weren't connected. Um, our our, our um, English learner families, our African American families, families that didn't have access to computers, so many felt disconnected. And they were getting messages from schools that would say things like, well, just send us an email, right? Um, if you don't know what the, the work is or if you need help. And we would say, well, we, we heard from you and from other partners, if a family didn't have a computer, how are they gonna send an email? If they were just sharing one cell phone for the whole family. I guess what I'd like to ask you, is, as we think about family engagement as a connector, as a bridge to improving some of the challenges that have been exacerbated during the pandemic, what should we be doing as we build out our family engagement program? We don't, we don't have enough staff who can go to every school and make better relationships, but if we had four or five staff, what could they do to help schools be more responsive, um, in your opinion, uh, to, to support better family engagement programs? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and definitely something that was raised by our survey and where we've seen great success in terms of family engagement, uh, what schools have been able to do is to really work, well, one, really making sure that they have staff that are available to speak with families in their home language, which is huge. And so, you know, if they're staff at the state level who can be assisting um, schools and thinking about that or figuring out how to make sure that is available and an option is really powerful. Um, and then we also know another important piece is just helping, especially at this moment, parents understand how and when to engage with schools. And so, you know, whether that's in regular dialogues or um, around when students are getting feedback on their academic work um, and figuring out regular intervals to be doing that so that parents are really plugged in um, and having support for that at the state level that then goes down to the, the local areas is also can also be really powerful as well. I appreciate that. Thank you. And as always, we appreciate being able to work closely with you. We've got all kinds of things we want to work on, expanding family engagement, um, expanding the, the youth voice. I think you touched on that. And, um, and, and obviously, whatever we can do to help offset the acceleration of learning gaps we are deeply committed to. Thank you. Great, and we now have some questions coming through the Q&A. So um, the first one, I think maybe you touched on Superintendent Thurmond um, on the school nurses, which was great. Um, the question is, can you talk about, sorry, reading the wrong question. Um, how are you working with school nurses in their critical role in safely opening schools? You know, we, we like to do more. We, you know, we're trying to build capacity for family engagement. We also don't have any medical staff at the, out of 2,500 employees in eight different locations across the state, we don't have anyone who has a health background. Years ago, CDE had a uh, sort of a nurse coordinator who could work with nurses at school uh, programs. And, you know, the state government saw fit to strip that funding away. And we've been working to try and rebuild it for a long time. And so we've looked to Medi-Cal as a way to try and build capacity, not just for CDE, but at the school level. We started a conversation right after the killing of George Floyd about alternatives to police on campus and that there needs to be a movement to bring on more restorative justice programs, any kind of de-escalation programs, more nurses, you know, caring adults who can be helpful 
uh, to our students. Recognizing that the state has literally very, very little money to allocate towards these programs, we look to programs like Medi-Cal. And, and to the person who asked the question, uh, you know, we heard from the California nurses something that we think is a great strategy. It's called Medi-Cal billing option. And we think it's a, a, a great possibility, but it provides 50% of the funding for say a nurse. And so that means that the school district would have to come up with the other 50%. And so we just think that there's money on the table at the federal level, but the programs have been structured in a way that they just have built in barriers that make it hard. School districts don't have extra money sitting around. And so we're spending a lot of time with, um, I wanna shout out uh, Alice Briscoe uh, and Nicole Taylor uh, from the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, who've really been helping us think through where can government and philanthropy work with schools to draw down more of those Medi-Cal dollars. I also want to shout out the Department of Social Services. They're, they're working with us in the conversation. We haven't quite figured it all out yet, but we're going to figure it out. Um, and we want to see a drawdown of more money that can be used for nursing positions, counseling, restorative justice, de-escalation, anything that's going to support our students. Thank you so much. And I believe we have a workshop on the LEA Medi-Cal uh, billing option uh, over the next few days. So please look for that in the, in the agenda. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll sign up and participate. Great, we'll partner on that. Um, question, can you talk about the role of advocacy uh, and how it can be enacted by public school employees? Sometimes school staff do not think they can advocate for policies um, that support equity, but they can educate. Can you speak to this? Sure. That could be either of you. Yeah, I'm happy to, to start. I mean, there's so much that each of us can do from wherever we sit, especially at this moment. And I would say both at the federal level and at the state level. So you know, a lot of the examples the superintendent Thurman just gave, which are really important, require resources, right? Financial resources. And right now, we know, for instance, at the federal level, there's, you know, we've had a lot of disagreement about another stimulus package. That package is super important to ensuring that schools are fully funded, that we can actually fund and continue to fund a lot of the work that's happening in school health centers. And so, you know, any personal advocacy that folks can do in terms of reaching out to their legislators um, who are in Washington and really encouraging them that, hey, we need another stimulus bill because there are things that we need in our state that we can't do alone. Um, that's really important. And that's something that every individual should really feel empowered to do. Um, at the state level this year, we had an opportunity to make some huge changes in California. So Prop 15, the proposition I mentioned before, um, schools and communities first, it would be a huge win for schools, for school health centers, um, because as I mentioned, California school funding, we're 38th in the country. And there's also been a lot of energy put in by big corporations to trying to fight against Prop 15. Um, and if we aren't able to get that federal funding, um, we need to be able to make sure as a state that we can support, um, especially financially, given the learning gaps we'll know we need to close and all the social emotional work that we'll need to do, those things are going to take resources. And that's why it's so important that folks either vote for Prop 15, that they send individual emails to all of their friends and family and let them know what Prop 15 is and that they should, should, should support it. And then also no contribution is too small for um, the campaigns either. And I would say the same thing is true of Prop 16. Is Prop 16 is a historic moment in this state's history. Um, being able to reinstate affirmative action, I think people get often confused and think about higher ed and higher ed admissions. And actually that's not what this is about. It's about being able to right now, for instance, in the way that K-12 is funded in local control, we can't even target funding to the schools that need it the most because we can't use race as a tool. And so being able to really make sure that Prop 16 is successful is huge. I mean, it was just introduced in June. So a lot of people aren't even aware that it exists or aware of like the possibilities that it could have in terms of really making sure Prop 15 is about adequate funding and Prop 16 is about equitable funding. So right, being able to target those funds to students that really need it. And so I would say if folks can get their friends and their families on board for both of those propositions, if they vote in support of them, um, if folks want to donate to them, every donation counts because this is a moment to really make sure that voters are aware that they exist. So there's a lot 
that individuals can do from wherever they sit. Crazy. If I could add on, I would also yeah. just, um, you know, I'm, I'm a constitutionally elected officer elected by 5 million people. So I'm the only person at the Department of Education who can talk about Prop 15 and Prop 16 in a direct advocacy way. I've endorsed both of them. I've been on panels uh, promoting them. I want to thank the Ed Trust West for sponsoring Prop 16, um, you know, and Assembly Member Shirley uh, Weber, uh, Dr. Shirley Weber, whose initial legislation got it on the ballot, ACA 5. Uh, it is so important. It talks about so many things about creating opportunity. That's all it is, is creating opportunity, removing barriers uh, for people of color and for women and small business and people who've been left out. Uh, that's Prop 16, um, you know, repealing the ban on affirmative action. Uh, the other is Prop 15, as you heard, schools and communities first. It just changes our tax structure to make sure that big corporations do the same thing that, you know, everyday Californians do, pay their fair share to provide more funding for education. You know, our schools, maybe they can't take an advocacy position, but they can explain to students what the measures on the ballot are. And we don't tell people how to vote, but there is the opportunity to explain what every single measure is. And there's some blockbuster measures that are gonna define really the future of California. And so um, that's an opportunity for our schools uh, is for them to explain what the measures are and to encourage civic engagement of our students. There's even a measure on the ballot right now that would allow a, for early voting for students who turn 18 between the primary and when the general election takes place. Again, we never tell students how to vote, but civic engagement is an important part of learning and it really builds character, it builds interest in supporting one's community. And you know, for students like, former students like me who really loved student government and learning about making a difference in the community, those things made me excited about school. And I believe that civic engagement plays an important part uh, and role in the education of our students. Thank you. It also builds agency, which I know is a theme that our keynote speaker tomorrow is gonna to, uh, talk about. Um, we have time for one more question and it's from a public policy student who asks, um, how do we begin to make policy changes as a student majoring in public policy? You know, obviously, uh, this is probably one of the most important elections of our time. Uh, it, it, to me, it's the difference between the viewpoints on everything from uh, dealing with the pandemic uh, and, and to dealing with racial justice and whether or not we'll have a leader who can be a, what I call a uniter in chief and bring people together at a time when we need healing. I think we have all the examples for why we need policy change. At the end of the day, it starts at the at the minimal level, but the most important level is voting. Voting does make a difference. In this election, there will probably be a hundred million people who, for the first time, will vote with a, a mail-in ballot. And so we've got to make sure that people understand the importance of getting those ballots in the mail by election day. This is a, a new way of voting for many of us. You know, I'm old school. I love going to the polls because I think about the sacrifices of those who were denied the right to vote, even when the law said that they could vote. So I always love going to the poll, casting that ballot, you know, that's just important to me. But I understand that right now, it is so important for education about the importance of voting. And because of the impacts of COVID, we're talking about health, right? Because of the impacts of COVID, for many, voting is going to have to occur um, with a, a mail-in ballot. And so we have a responsibility to educate so that people understand that your vote will count, uh, how to do it um, and how to make it easy uh, for folks. One thing that's not known, Tracy, is that schools by law are required to be available to be polling places during the election. Now, it's a little bit tough when you're dealing with the pandemic and some schools have reopened and you know they're trying to keep small class sizes and keep fewer people on campus. But for all of those schools that are gonna be in distance learning and their campus is not gonna be fully occupied, that's an opportunity to serve as a polling place to make sure that those who still wanna vote in person have the opportunity to do it. So to the questioner, I would just say that you make change through voting. Obviously in California, our state legislature is active on every one of these issues. And the California Health Alliance has sponsored legislation that would allow for building of more 
um, health clinics. And so uh, get involved with organizations like the Alliance and others that do, and, and, and at Trust West and others that do take an advocacy position towards legislation that would improve what I call all the quality of life challenges that we're dealing with, health, education, creating good jobs, and of course, taking care of our environment, um, environmental justice and advocacy, very, very, very important. And I would just also emphasize one of the things that I think few people know or recognize is that Prop 16 actually came from students. So students approached Shirley Weber about a year and a half ago and they said, hey, we are in universities across the state where we don't feel represented and we feel like we need affirmative action back in this state. And that's what then led to you know, what was ACA 5 and has now turned into Prop 16. And so I would say you, your voice is powerful. You know, those students approached Dr. Weber at an event at their campus. I mean, look what it's led to. Now we have a ballot measure this November. We, we seek out student groups all the time actually to work closely with because our goal is not to be advocating for the policies of the 23 folks at Ed Trust West, but instead to be advocating for what students, parents and families across the state say is a policy change that they want to see. And so we're always seeking out student groups. We work with the UC student group and the CSU student group and the community college student group and other student groups across the state. And so I would just um, really say that never let your voice be silent or feel like it's not important because it can lead to huge policy change. It, it's so true. I was gonna say that the voices of students really do shape policy and practice. Um, uh, one more health example, too, to tie in. After the killing of George Floyd, we organized what we call the virtual support circle for young people to have a way to give voice to their feelings. And to we asked our Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who you all know is an expert in dealing with trauma, to really give some doctorly advice to our students. It was fantastic. It launched for us what we call a, a, a virtual support circle series. But our students came back and they said, in addition, they said, that they wanted to see in their school and in their history books, the history of people who look like them. They wanted to see the accomplishments of people of color that have shaped California and shaped our nation. And they basically questioned out loud, why haven't we been provided these opportunities to learn about the histories of various groups of people of color who've shaped California's history? And so from their push, we created what we call a mini series on ethnic mm -hmm. studies to give an introduction to our students about the contributions of African Americans and Latinos and Native Americans and Asian American and Pacific Islanders. And it was a fabulous series. Dr. Shirley Weber helped us kick it off. Dolores Huerta, uh, so many, uh, Karen Korematsu, the daughter of the late slain uh, icon, Fred Korematsu. Um, Assembly member James Ramos, the first Native American person to serve in the California legislature. So many great folks and great professors of ethnic studies helping us. Again, as, as Dr. Smith Ayaga says, the push came from students who said, we want to see something different in our schools that will give us self-esteem uh, for, for students who come from different groups of color. But they also recognize that everyone benefits from ethnic studies, regardless of their background, we all do, because it's about the contributions of people to our state and our nation. We'll be, we're actually gonna be uh, uh, releasing another version of the Ethnic Studies mini series, and young people are a big part of how we bring that about. And so uh, there's no question, youth play a voice in helping to shape policy. I'm so excited for that series. I'm sure we all are. Um, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate that some of the strands that you've um, brought, both brought up today are going to continue through the next three day, two days. Um, I appreciate we have all seen the resilience of young people and their families. And I also think if we're successful in challenging the status quo, as you're both asking us to do and we want to do, then we shouldn't expect our young people to be as resilient as they've had to be, especially our low income students of color. Um, so we, ho we hope that they, we can get them a break in the future um, with all this uh, legislation and all of our supports. So I'm gonna move to a little bit of housekeeping now. Um, uh, I wanna announce our raffle winners from yesterday. Um, and I understand if Superintendent Thurman or Dr. Smith Ariaga uh, need to get off again with great thanks from us for all your contributions today and, and in your work. Thank you, so thank you both. Raffle, thank you so much. Thank you so much.
And I also want to say that you'll be hearing more from me as the executive director of CSHA in uh, later parts of today and tomorrow. So um, for the fun stuff, we had some raffle winners yesterday. Um, they are Stephanie Lim, Carly Randolph, the crowd is cheering, Melissa Reyna, Jennifer Williams, and Lindsay Marlborough. So congratulations to you all. Um, and as you are hearing, there are many opportunities to um, continue winning these prizes. So I wanna encourage you all to take a few minutes to look at our exhibitors and sponsors, again, who've made this event possible. Um, before the next session, if you can get in by clicking on the tabs that are near the speakers um, and the agenda tabs in the platform. And then don't forget to click on the contests tab and take the exhibitor and sponsor raffle quiz. I think it's a different one each day. Um, and check out all those virtual booths. Um, they're pretty cool, some of them. Also, don't forget to complete your evaluation each day. Um, that enters you into the raffle. It's a new evaluation or a different evaluation each day, and we will send it through the events feed. Um, the raffle prizes for today include a weekend getaway with wine tasting, Beats headphones, and through gift cards. So one of our next events is Mary Jane, our, our fearless MC. She's gonna be hosting um, a presentation that weaves together two big themes in school health, oral hygiene and kickboxing, only Mary Jane. So after that, starting at 10.30, we have seven diverse workshops to choose from, um, some really great workshops. And finally, please, please join us back here at 1.30 today we're going to honor school-based health legend, Dr. Barbara Staggers. And I really hope you can join us to hear the phenomenal things that people have to say about a woman that helped create this movement in California um, and continues to be a driving force behind so much what's going on in this state. So that's all for this, for, um, this plenary session. Thank you for being here. Um, be safe, enjoy the rest of the day.